Okay, so why do I never take a branch off the end of a main duck run? Does anybody remember? You said that if you go straight off the end of it, it's the path of least resistance and it reduces the pressure going down the side runs. Yeah, if I would put a register right here instead of just a cap, my airflow is going to primarily come out of that register rather than taking the bends, okay, because air likes flowing a straight line. So we never, ever take a um, register and put it on the end of a main duct run. Some people will do it on the end of a return. I don't even really like doing that for the same reason. I, I want my, like my return grills. Okay, if I have a return grill, we're going to put it here, near the door. We're going to put a return grill someplace in here. I'd probably pull it over near the door more. Okay, we're going to put a return grill. I actually do like putting a return grill sort of I'd probably put it along this wall someplace. And again, it all depends on the room. So I'd probably put it there. Um, I like putting return grills near doors. Okay. And this one, I wouldn't put it here. I'd probably put it right down in that direction. And again, because... Um, because I want to create this air pattern. I want my supplies on the outside, and I want my return return grill someplace here. Okay, now what else can you tell me about this? Do we have two separate zones of heating in this house or cooling? Do you see two different sort of living areas, two different use areas here? Anybody? Yes, we got food. Go on. Alex, or whoever just said that, go ahead. Do we see two different complete zones here? Yeah, we got the big space right there and then next to the to the in the corner of the house right there. Okay, so are you saying if I if I drew a line to separate the two zones, where would I draw my line? Horizontally from the kitchen to the to the other uh, master bath bathroom. So sort of like this? Oh, I wasn't saying diagonally, but I was thinking more horizontal with the kitchen window on over to the to the master bathroom and the separate it that way but okay you're thinking this way yeah but because that mass that main living area that's where you can spend most of your time but and then the two bedrooms down at the bottom is kind of a lot going on down there okay that the looks like it's a master bedroom up here in the top right yeah that's what i was saying the, the, li yes. the main living area in the master bedroom but that makes sense too the way you you were doing it with the diagonal like doesn't it yeah doesn't it make sense since at night you probably need a little less than during the day when you're active and cooking and everything else this way you're zoning off the uh uh the the area that's used at night more from the area that's used during the day more yeah yeah so if i had to put a uh, two thermostats into this house. Where would I put the thermostats? Living room or dining room. Yeah, the living room wall next to the, uh, the supply. Unit. Near the return? Well, on this, on this picture, yeah. And then... And then where else? I'd say one of the, one of the two bedrooms down, maybe in the, the main hallway. Um, Down towards the two two bedrooms. Maybe Would, like you have two options here, depending on how you want to look at this. 
Okay, I could put one down, and that's going to be very tough for you to see. I that's what I was one. meaning right there. Yeah, in the hallway there. Okay. Or. Or how about the foyer area? The other well, one. you mean right in here? Isn't this the front door that's right off the kitchen? The 3678? Yeah, this looks like it's the front door, but that's going to be sort of on this thermostat there. <laughs> So I'm looking on how I need to control the zone that's on the right side of this house. Uh, your yeah, your best bet, if you're trying for even, your best bet's where you got it. If yeah. you're if you're trying for maybe adult control, I would put it closer to the master bedroom if the back room was the master bedroom. See, this is an interesting dilemma because you know I I don't know if you noticed I didn't drop a return in this hallway here. Okay, I put all the returns in the room. So if I put a thermostat here, what I really need to do, okay, is I do need to drop a return, even if it's a small one, I need to drop a return in this hallway. Because if I don't drop a return in that hallway, that thermostat will never sense what's happening in the rooms. And I probably wouldn't, put, and I would probably drop it very close to that thermostat in the ceiling. Make sense? Okay, because yeah. if I don't drop a return in that hallway, that hallway is a dead zone, basically. Now, having said that, there's a big open airflow from the living room where I have a thermostat right there to this hallway. This is really not a separate zone, right? No. Look at, look at the floor space where this thermostat is up here in the living room to the left of that line. There's no doors separating that thermostat there, right? So what's going to happen to this, ther what space is this thermostat actually going to work off of? Anybody? You're going to need, you're, you're, you're going to need to put one of the, the other the thermostat for the right zone. You're going to need to put that other thermostat into one of the rooms. Is this just a two-zone house? It might be. You may need to make it a three-zone house. If I were going for comfort in this house, okay, I would be doing... Uh, I'd probably go over in this one. I would do one, two, and three, because we really do have three zones. Because what's happening on this front corner, on the other side of all the bathrooms, closets, and everything else like that, might be quite a bit different than what's happening in the master suite which is going to be quite a bit different than what's happening in the um, in the kitchen and living room area. Does that make sense to everybody, what I'm showing you? Yes and no. I was just curious, because when you originally talked about two thermostats, it made sense to add a damper into one of your supply yep. uh, trunks, if you will. But with three thermostats, then it gets a little more complicated, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's going to get more complicated. And in this case, what I would do is I'd be having a damper there, there, and there. Hmm. Interesting. Now, what would I'm happen... Sorry, I'm sorry, where, where did you have those dampeners again? I, look at my magenta lines. There, 
there, and there. Okay. Do you see them? Yeah. Okay. I would be putting dampers there. Now, what happens to the air handler and the airflow if only one zone is calling for cooling? Let's say it's my master suite that needs cooling. Okay, and let me just fix something here because my master suite is going to also have a supply register down there as well. Okay, my master suite needs cooling. What's going to happen? The dampeners on the others are going to close partially, so the majority, so the air is going into the other. But if it, clo if it closes totally, then you're going to have too much CFM going through that. Okay, you're going to have to, a very high static pressure in the, let's say, the master suite, which is this area over here. You're going to have extremely high static pressure in this duct run, right? in the duct run for the master suite. You're going to have extremely high static pressure. What's going to happen to these duct runs over here if these dampers are closed? If that damper's closed to my living room kitchen, if that damper's closed to my front, we obviously have no airflow, right? Correct. Right. So my air handler is sized for 400 CFM of air roughly per ton. Okay, that's our, that's our goal, 400 CFM per ton. So if my air handler is only getting the, if we're only able to put about half a ton of cooling into my master, actually, let's say you can say it's a three-ton system and I can only put one ton of cooling into my master suite area because that looks about right. So let's just write on here, we'll say it's a three ton. Okay. And I can only put one ton of cooling out. That's 400 CFM out of 1200 CFM. Where does the rest of my, where does the rest of it go? That's a good question. Does it matter? Can I just push one ton of cool, one ton of air through there, 400 CFM? No. Doesn't that become an issue? Yeah. What's going to, for those of you who've had, I mean, you've all had refrigeration, and we've talked about airflow across coils. Some of you guys have had air conditioning. We've talked about airflow across coils. What's going to happen to that coil if I'm not moving enough air? It's going to freeze up. It's going to freeze up. Yep, yep. Yeah. it's going to totally freeze up. Okay, so what we do in this situation, there's a, sol there's a solution for this. Okay, we build what's called a bypass. Okay, we build what's called a bypass. And this bypass... basically comes, it's a set of duct that just comes from the supply plenum and comes back to the return plenum. In that duct work, there's a damper. And this is usually like large duct work. There's a damper that's in that duct work. It's called a static pressure bypass damper. Okay, static pressure. So as the static pressure of the duct increases, that damper is going to start opening and it's going to bypass air from the supply to the return. Because we then we make we continue to get the required airflow across that coil. 
Now, how else can we prevent that coil from freezing up? Because sooner or later, that coil is going to freeze up. What can we do? Run a, like a defrost cycle or something like that? Uh, you're close. You're really close on that. No, I'm not going to defrost the coil because I really don't have a good way to do it. But what if I shut the condensing unit? What if I shut the condensing uh, unit off? What if I had a okay. thermostat that was on that coil that was set to 32 degrees? And so you're going to have you're going to have a low temperature a low temperature uh, 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 switch set up. It gets down there and it shuts the uh, condenser off, and that's it. Yeah, that's a, that's sort of exactly what I'm going to do. Okay, is I'm going to um, put what's called a freeze stat. Okay, you buy these from you buy these in any supply house. Okay, it's called a freeze stat. It's two wires. It's a little disc type thermostat. I don't know if you guys remember when I was in the shop with you, I showed you on the side of an evaporator, one of the evaporators from the um, that on the training board that we're building. I showed you a little disc type thermostat that's attached to the to the coil. All we do is use a little disc type thermostat. It's called a freeze stat. We put it on the coil. Once that coil reaches 32 degrees, we shut off the condenser. We leave the air handler running. The customer never even notices. And we, the, we blow that air across that coil. That coil is going to warm up. The differential on the free stat is set to like 45 degrees. So it's a 45 on and a 32 off. Okay, which would be 45 closed, 32 open. And we cycle that on that so that coil never freezes up. Okay, so if you do zone systems, okay, where you put a damper in here, damper in there, damper in there, which is a, it's a great way to do systems. There's a lot of comfort here, okay, because there's different areas all have their own control of the thermostat. But you have to have a bypass damper, and you need to have a freeze stat, okay? Some people will try to get around this whole idea by saying, okay, well, we'll never totally close that damper. We'll never totally close that damper. And then there's some other people that actually just dump that excess air into the attic, why people would waste that much energy, I'm not sure. But the right way to do it is you put in a static pressure bypass damper between the supply and the return, and you add a freeze stat. Okay, keeps the system from freezing up, keeps everybody comfortable, and we have three zones in the house. But again, this has to be thought out when you do your duct work, because you have to be able to completely shut down different zones. Does anybody have any questions on this? Does it sort of make sense to you? It, it does, but I guess my question is when you shut the condenser down uh, at 32 or 33 degrees to keep it from getting free, uh, freezing, at where, what's, the, um, what's the counter to that so that it doesn't take too long to come back on and then the house ends up going up and down in temperature? Because as you're blowing air across that indoor coil, it's going to warm up very fast to 45. This isn't a timed on, timed off. This is a, we're just shutting the condenser down. We're leaving the air handler running. And we're allowing that coil temperature to come up above the freeze space again. So we're still... Okay, so, so, that, so that shutoff, that shutoff opens up again at 45. Cl closes. We open at 32, so we're opening a switch at 32. Right. We're closing right. a switch Sorry. at 45. Okay. okay. And because 45 degrees is still under the room temperature, because you're not running air conditioning, we hope that the room temperature is 45 or under. Okay, so that room temperature is still getting cooled by that 45 degree coil. We've just gotten it out of the possibility of freezing. Does that answer your question? Yes, I didn't realize that the 
that the uh, switch had both on off uh, built into it. Yeah, what we want to do is basically it's it's the open is at 32, and then there's a differential of whatever the difference is there, and we um, pull it so it's a differential of like 13, and we turn it back on once it reaches the end of that differential. Just like a pressure switch, just like just about any other thermostat. So that's, that is a really a requirement, and believe it or not, that's a $5 part that the majority of a lot of contractors who install zoning miss. Okay, $5 part that a lot of people miss that will cause an iceberg to grow in someone's attic and eventually take out a ceiling. So, questions on this? Now, how would you size this ductwork? If you were sizing this, okay, and I'm not having you guys do this for your project. I've already given your, your end project, um, I've already given you your final project, what you need to turn in, but let's just say you need to size this. How would you size this ductwork up? Wouldn't we go through the exercise we've already gone through, find out what the CFM requirement for the room is, and then use that chart to find out, based on the static friction, what we can use without going over the static friction that we want as a, a, a limit? You mean this chart? Yes, but then there was also a chart you gave us that uh, actually said if you're using this duct at this static you know, this then, you know. Yeah, this, it, you, was, you're talking the rectangular one, right? Yeah, yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, either way, um, just so you know, and I'm not sure if I said it on a recording or if I said it separately to this group, um, whenever you can possibly do so, you can run. If you have the space to run round duck versus rectangular, use round. Okay, if you can Why? run round duct versus rectangular, use round. Does anybody know why? Other than it being easier to work with? Less air Yeah, there's resistance. an airflow reason. Does anybody remember why? Less airflow resistance. Yeah, we went over that with the, yeah, the less resistance because of the corners in the, in the rectangular pipe or ducting. Less yeah. charge, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's exactly right. Anytime we have corners in ductwork, we create air patterns. So if you can run ductwork without corners, you're in much better shape. Okay, okay. now where can, so if you're in an attic, okay, and if you have the space to run round ductwork, stick with round ductwork. Also, I hate to say it, it's easier to install than just about any other ductwork. Okay, if you are, um, in a situation where, if we go back to our house here, coming off of the plenum, okay, the plenum, you have a return plenum and you have a supply plenum that's sort of right next to the unit. Okay, coming off these plenums, you might not be able to make your plenum round, but then as soon as you get to the main ductwork, you can probably make that area round. Okay, and again, it's much easier and it's much more efficient to run the round ductwork. Okay, square ductwork also has to be manufactured in a sheet metal shop. Or if you're down south, you, you build it out of ductboard, which is nasty stuff as well. But round ductwork is a cut snapped together in the field. Not to mention it doesn't have corners. So anytime you can use round ductwork, try to use round ductwork. Of course, if you need to, like, if this room is calling for 800 CFM, okay, let's just say this area here is 800 CFM. Okay, if we go back over to our ductwork sizing, okay, and I'm looking for 800 CFM, okay, we may be... On this line here, I really don't want to be over 0.5 static pressure if I can avoid it, but I want to move as much air as I can possibly move. 
Okay, so yeah, I'm going to be... you're into 15 inches. Uh, or 14 inches at, I mean, I could do 14 inches, okay, but again, that's going to be, might be a little bit noisy. Yeah, you're right, I'm looking about 15 inch round. Now, again, depending on what your attic looks like, you could put 15 inch round here. And you're only going to have 15 inch round prior to the first takeoff. Okay, because if I'm moving 800 CFM, splitting it among four takeoffs, I am losing 200 CFM at every takeoff. Everybody see that? If I have four takeoffs in this space that's calling for 800 CFM, I'm losing 200 CFM at every branch. Okay. Um, with, that, with that said, um, if you have the room, and if money's not the issue and stuff like that, does it matter if you run the 800 the full length of the main? Yeah, it does. It actually does. Okay, because let's say, let me just, I'm going to put some numbers in here, and I'm going to, I'm going to increase the magnification of this just a little bit. We'll lose part of the house, but that's okay. Okay, so we're using, we're using the ductwork step down as part of the control for the CFM. Yeah, and we want to do that. So let's say I have 800 CFM here, okay, in my main line coming out to this left side. Okay, I have four branches that I'm going to get 200 CFM, and I'm going to have to move that one a little. And so I have 200 CFM there. I am going to put 200 CFM here. Well, Okay, I'm going to put 200 CFM not there, and I'm going to put 200 CFM over here. So my main trunk, this direction, is at the point of the damper is sized for 800 CFM. When I get over to this area, I have to, my main damper is now 600 CFM. When I get to this area, my main duct is now only 400 CFM. Okay, and I would probably put a T in here just to keep things easier. Okay, where I have 200 CFM in each direction. So, if I what I'm worried about is if I keep everything down here totally as 800 CFM, I my furthest ducts are not going to have what we call the velocity and the throw, how fast it's coming out of the end of the ductwork. Okay, so I'm not I'm not maintaining my static pressures as I move through that ductwork. So if I drop the ductwork size, and again this isn't a perfect install. Okay, this is a situation where Remember, I keep saying money's not an object and skill of installers is not an object. Okay, so I want to drop my ductwork sizing down based on the CFM that remains. It's called the longest length method, basically. So this area here, this area here is getting the same static pressure and the same velocities as the rest of the ductwork is getting. Does that make sense? Anybody? Yes, yes it, yes, it does. It clarifies a lot. Okay. Anybody else have any questions on that? Okay. So when you look at your rooms, okay, and again, if you were taking your project to the ductwork sizing, which we are not, because that will be handled, again, that's handled in the trade skills course, but... We've talked about ducts work sizing. So if you were taking your rooms on your spreadsheet, see if I can find my copy of the spreadsheet real quick. Um, if you were taking your rooms on your spreadsheet, okay, and if you were looking at, okay, the summary sheet is what I'm looking at. Okay, so if you were looking at your summary sheet, 
you have the CFMs per room. So as you get further and further away from your main air handler, okay, you need to think about what sizing your ductwork would be. That would be the next step of your project if you were doing this in real life. Now, is there a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it? Is there one answer for this? There's a better way to do it if you size duct properly. Well, yeah, I mean, we have some rules that depending on if you depending on the money, amount of money the customer wants to pay, we can either use all one size duct work, we can reduce the size, we can do stuff like that as long as we maintain our 400 CFM per ton of cooling. But is there any is there any specific place that I want to put air handlers in an attic? Is there any specific way I need to zone houses? Is there any specific, like, requirements or a right or a wrong answer for anything I drew in here? Could I have drawn this in another way and still been right? No, it's not locked in. You just have to follow proper procedures so when you put it together, it works properly. Yeah, it's all about occupant comfort and safety. Okay, do I need to have, so if I'm presenting this to a customer, the way it's laid out here, customer comes back to me and says, I don't want to spend this amount of money. Well, I have an easy solution. Okay, we can go to my good area, and I could subtract out these dampers. I'm not going to do that on this one because I'm going to share this one up on, I'll post what I just did here. But um, I could take out the dampers. Okay, I could take out these spare thermostats. Customer says it's still too much money. I could go to a central return. Okay, granted, I would warn them your spaces are not going to be heat. My far bedrooms are no longer going to be heating and cooling exactly properly. So everything you take off, there's a trade-off in comfort. Okay, um, when you get down to a certain point, you and your you and your boss or whoever you're working for, if you're working for someone else, have to make a decision. Do I want to install a system that people will not be happy with, or do I eventually say pass on the job? I don't know. I think there's some people in here who work as um, contractors or um, home improvement contractors. I think there's a couple of you. And there's a point you come to where someone wants to be cheap enough where you're just going to say, pass, okay, I do it frequently, um, because it's just not well, worth your name being installed on a system that isn't going to work right and isn't going to keep the people happy. That, that carries over into pretty much everything. I've got years of experience in sales. And the jobs you walk away from are the ones that would have been massive headaches if you had taken it. It would have been, you know, calls on a regular basis, service calls on a regular basis, and you would never, ever have had a satisfied customer from it. I worked when I first got, when I first graduated, actually before I graduated from Porter and Chester, one of the, I worked, I was working for a contractor in Massachusetts, and one of the things she regularly said, this was a very high-end contractor. I mean, we installed systems. A split system installation would be like $24,000. Um, one of the things she always used to say is, pay me now or pay me later. And it comes back to it. If you install a system that's too cheap, and if a customer chooses the cheap route out, I guarantee I'll make that money back on service calls because they're not going to be happy. A lot of building contractors say, if my temperature is set at 77 degrees, let's say, and it's usually right in the specs for the building. Okay, so if this thermostat is set for, oops, let me get a circle on that, is set for 77 degrees. Okay, if that thermostat is set for 77 degrees, then the house in every corner of the house has to be within two degrees. I don't know. Anybody know Toll Brothers? 
Anybody ever heard of Toll Brothers houses? No. It's a big contractor, and I'm surprised you haven't heard about them because they're actually based in um, in your area. It's a nationwide construction firm that does these, I call them the McMansions, okay? They do these big cookie-cutter housing developments where everything is basically the same. They just go in and build 100 houses at one time, okay? They look expensive, but they're extremely cheap, okay? We walked away from a Toll Brothers contract because they decided they no longer wanted to pay for zoning in the houses, and they only wanted one thermostat and one um, return. They wanted a central return. And we walked away from it because there's no way in a um, 2,500-square-foot house, two-story, that we could, with one thermostat, maintain a two-degree temperature difference on a cold winter day between the upstairs back bedroom and where the thermostat was. We couldn't do it. There's there's a housing development company in this area. A bunch of my Amish friends do finish work for them. And they actually walked away as well. Two months ago, or four months ago, they said that from now on they're doing the central return and they want all doors to be cut so there's a two-inch space under all the inside doors so that they get enough airflow to the return. <laughs> yeah. That, that, by the way, doesn't work too well. So, yeah, I don't blame them for walking away from that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. No way. Well, their, their whole issue was cutting, you know, interior doors to that height. They had to figure out how to resupport it because the whole bottom support piece of wood between the two Luons were gone. Yeah, and there's also those are there's a pride of appearance there too because a two inch gap at the bottom of a bedroom door or bottom of hallway doors or whatever that's a pretty big gap. Yeah, it looks like crap. Yeah, it looks like crap. Sure. Okay, not to mention there's some privacy issues there too. Um, yeah, it's just not a good idea. So the whole central return thing, but again, part of why I'm having this conversation is this comes out to when you're in the field, where is it the right place to walk away from a job? Okay, granted, you want to get every bit of income you have. Granted, you may not have the, you may not be in a position to walk away from the job when you're working for somebody else. But you also have to think sooner or later, you're going to want to run your own company. Most of you have that as a goal. Okay, you want to be able to work for yourself, you want to build something for the future, and you want to run your own company. Okay, four or five years down the road, you're going to be in a position to do that. But you have to, in the back of your mind, start thinking about what is the right thing to do. Okay, is it right to install a system just because a customer is going to pay you for it? Or is that degrading the whole industry by allowing crap installs? Okay, in my opinion, I'd rather walk away from a job than to install a crap install because my name's all over it. Okay, I'm the guy pulling the permits. I'm the guy who has my name on the air handler. So if someone decides that afterwards, oh, yeah, it's cold. We hate this install. Um, it's not keeping temperatures properly. Oh, let's go on Facebook and, or whatever the social media platform is, and let's slam this company because they can never get it fixed. They forget to tell everybody Oh, we chose the cheap install. So this is all part of customer service as well as ductwork sizing. Does it take you slightly more time and a few extra fittings to reduce this ductwork? But in the long run, is it worth reducing the ductwork because it's going to allow comfort in the end? So that all comes together as a part of this. Any questions on this whole ductwork thing on how I laid this out? No. Okay, and it's just when you're doing this, it's just a matter of having done it. Uh, you do it over and over again. When you start in the field, you're primarily going to be doing preventative maintenance. Okay, no contractor is going to toss you in a truck and say, here, go do service calls. 
Okay, so when you first start in the field, you're going to be doing preventative maintenance. You're going to be going out cleaning equipment. You're going to be doing the yearly checkups. You're going to be doing the let's go change a zillion filters in Home Depot. Okay, and you're going to, you're going to be doing preventative maintenance. Okay, that is actually a good thing. Enjoy that time. Because when you get into the field, if you, once you're through the preventative maintenance stage, okay, you're suddenly seeing equipment that's not working. Okay, doesn't it help to see equipment that's working in advance of being stuck on equipment that's not working? I always think so. Okay, so enjoy that preventative maintenance side of it because you're, it's the only time in your career you're going to be seeing the equipment that's working. Okay, now, what are you going to see? If you get out to a house, what are you going to see? If this damper is broken, so let's say this damper, okay, that's right here, is no longer working. I turned it black. What are you going to see? What's going to be the symptoms you see? You need some condensation. If this damper no. is stuck. Right. Oh, hold on. Which position it's in? If that's bro if that's broken, it's stuck open. Then that's the safety uh, default, right? No, believe it or not, um, yeah, it's going to be power power closed, spring open is what most okay. Do. Power closed. So, spring so open. okay. So if it's broken and it's open, then what you're going to get is uh, you're going to get more temp more uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you're going to get a lower temperature when in cooling in the rooms further off of that leg than you originally wanted. Basically, okay, basically, regardless of what thermostat is calling, I'm going to be getting airflow down this direction. Okay, now, who said condensation? Because I, that is not a, you will see a little bit of condensation. I did. Okay, you're going to see condensation on this damper a little bit and it's not going to be a lot okay because there's going to be somewhat it never breaks just in the plain open position it's always broken a little bit usually what happens is one of these veins in these dampers one of the damper veins breaks and it's sort of stuck in an open closed situation so you may see some condensation and it's going to be noisy but the dead giveaway is these rooms down here are going to be cold or hot depending on whatever the season is. Yeah, but why would you have condensation build up if your static bypass is working properly? Because Isn't that still monitoring the overall? When this is open, it may not have enough pressure to pop that. Okay. Okay. If this is open down this direction, and again, you, remember I said you may see condensation depending on the situation. But if this is open or partially open, that static pressure might not have enough um, pressure to open it anymore. Okay, but where I'm talking about where you might see condensation is right here. Because of the interference with the airflow, there's going to be a lot of turbulence in there. And noise is a big factor here. Now, in heating mode, would you see condensation? No, just cooling mode. Because there's going to be a slight restriction here. Okay, but here's the thing. You're, the, the real thing that you're looking for is you're looking for, um, the real issue you're looking for is you're looking for that um, bad temperature control here. If my static pressure is broken and if it's stuck in the closed position, what am I going to be seeing? If my static pressure is broken and it's in the closed position, what am I going to be seeing? You're going to get a frozen coil, aren't you? I have a freeze stat on it. Okay, so no, you're going to get a lot. You're going to get a lot of pressure if you're only running one thermostat. It's going to be a lot of CFM and a lot of noise. 
Very, very noisy. And the vote will be super cold or hot. What was that? I didn't hear that. Repeat that, please. The road could be super cold, super hot, depending on what. Eh, yeah, depending on that, but more the noise. But I was looking for um, what's going to be going on with my outdoor unit. What's happening with that outdoor unit? What's one of the symptoms? The temperature, if it dropped below 32, it will shut off. So is that outdoor unit going to be cycling more than normal? Is it going to be coming on, off, on, off, on, off? Anybody? It'll be short cycling and it won't remove the humidity. It's going to be short cycling and I'm going to have a humidity control problem. Now, I am not 100% sure if this, I know we didn't talk about this, but most units have a time delay in it to prevent compressors from burning out because of constant on and off. We want to let the refrigerant pressures equalize. And those of you going into air conditioning next term, this is something we do discuss in the air conditioning electrical. For those, I know I have some people on the night class on this call. For those of you in air conditioning right now, I am pretty sure time delay relays were discussed, okay? We normally have a five to ten minute anti-cycle control in the condensers or in the thermostat. If it is in the thermostat, you don't have a thing to worry about because the condenser will cycle uh, properly. Okay, based on the free stack. If it, the time delay is in the condenser, okay, every single time this free stack closes or opens, there's going to be a five to ten minute delay turning this back on. So another sign of a static pressure being stuck in the closed position is if the space is not maintaining temperature. It's getting hot because of that free stack that's in that compress or the anti cycle that's in that compressor. Okay, so again, comfort, noise, and just things not working right, okay? That's what you're going to get the call on, is the noise or the comfort of that call. What if it's stuck open? What if this static pressure stuck open? What's going to be your service call? What, are you going to, what is the customer going to see? No, aren't they aren't they aren't they aren't they going to have trouble uh, maintaining the temperature they want because of that bypass running constantly? Yes. Temperature issues. They're going to call in and say, "You know what? My living room is never maintaining temperature. It's getting hot. My bedroom or the whole house is getting warm." It's going to be a temperature control issue. They're just going to feel warm, and it's not going to be efficient. Okay, because in zone systems, there's really only three things that can go wrong. My dampers fail, my static pressure fails, or my zone panel fails, because the, zone, the zones are wired to a control panel. Those are the three things that can really go wrong in a zone system. So, again, dampers are used in ductwork to create the zones. You have to lay out zones properly. You have to think about zoning when you put in the system. Even if you put in a system that's on one thermostat that's in a house like this, it may pay to put in, to lay your ductwork out as though you were going to zone it eventually. The reason for that is very, very simple. If the customer chose not to do the multiple thermostats in the zones initially, okay, you may want to be able to go back afterwards when they start complaining and say, yeah, we can install those zone, those zone dampers and it will fix the entire problem. So it might be worth doing it as a, hey, I know I'm going to eventually do this. Let's set it up so I can do it properly when it's come to do, when it comes time that the customer wants it. When you, when you set up a system, for a house and we go through that spreadsheet and it gives us all the 
information, the heat loss, heat gain, uh, CFM, and, and all that stuff. It, if you put in, you know, lots of zones, lots of these complicated adders so that you can, you know, really zero in on temperature in specific parts of the house, does it ever add enough load where you have to go maybe a half ton bigger for everything to work efficiently? You won't have to, you won't have to increase system size, okay, because you're still sizing it on the building, okay. I might have to play with blower speeds, okay. okay. You've already run into a situation where you need a slightly more CFM than tonnage, okay. So you might have to play with blower speeds because, remember, everything I put in airflow, like this damper, this damper, this T, this T, this damper. Everything that I put in airflow creates resistance. We talked about that when I was talking about static pressures, okay? Everything that I put in a ductwork creates resistance. So okay. we might have to upsize the blower or turn the blower onto higher blower speed to overcome that resistance. But you won't have to change the tonnage of the equipment. A matter of fact, a lot of contractors, if you have a zone system, and I do not recommend this, but a lot of contractors will drop this, drop the um, tonnage of the equipment by a quarter ton. Or sometimes I know one guy that drops at 25% for a zone system. And again, I don't like that idea, but some people do that. Because they say, are they just, are they? What was that, Dave? Are they going to justify it by saying that you're not going to have the whole thing demanding all the time at the same time? Yeah, that's how they justify it. And again, I don't buy into that. I don't like that idea. I would rather install it properly and make sure I have the static pressure bypass, make sure I have the freeze stat. And the other thing that you do on zone that now is available, it wasn't available when I came back, when I started in the field, the ECM motors. Okay. The ECM motors will ramp up and down based on static pressure. So if I install a three ton air handler with an ECM motor, Okay, it will actually change the motor speed based on the air handler. So that is something important to remember as well. It will actually ramp up and down based on pressure and resistance in the ductwork. So it actually fixes a whole bunch of um, sins with ductwork. But we didn't have that way, way back when. That's relatively new. Okay, any questions anybody has on anything that I went over today so far? I don't. Uh, one question about return locations. Okay. Um, I've got a... Uh, I wanted to make sure I had enough on this design because I actually added, after our conversation a little earlier, I added a couple of more supplies, one in the laundry room and one in the uh, bathroom. Um, and because I did that, I also, because of the wide open space of the dining room, living room, and kitchen, I put an extra one in the, uh, an extra supply in the kitchen. I do a lot of cooking and it does get warm in there. Um, with the returns, can I, near stairs, is a return, is there an issue with a return near stairs or no? A couple questions. Does the stairway have a door like the one that I'm showing here or is it wide open? No, it's open. It's, it's wide open. Okay, stairs going up or down? Up. Okay. The down one, the down ones underneath on the other side have a door. Okay. The so the stairs to the second floor. Is there another? Re, would there be if you were doing this in real life? Would you put another return at the top of those stairs? I would because I would because remember we discussed I would have an air conditioning unit downstairs. 
Yep. And I would have a, a you know, in the basement for the first floor, and I would have a heat pump in the attic for the second floor. So the return on the, uh, at the top of the stairs would be for the other unit, or in that hallway would be for the other unit. Honestly, I would not put a return at the bottom of those stairs. I'd pick another, if you feel you need an extra return because of the wide open space, I would find another place to do it. I might, I might pull it around um, depending on how much space you have between walls and stuff like that, I might come around the corner. I might yeah, have... I can do that. Okay. And my reason for that is that return at the top of the stairs is going to handle the hot air rising. Well, the, the, the return at the top of the stairs, I wasn't going to put one right at the top. I was going to put it down the hall. Uh, because there's three bedroom doors in the hall. Yeah. I was going to put one in the hall, and, and then, of course, uh, there'd be one in each of the bedrooms. Yeah, I think that upstairs return is going to handle any heat rising up those stairs, because if I have a choice, if airflow has a return choice of going in a return duct or just going up the stairs, it's going to pick the easier flow, which is up okay. the stairs. Now, putting a return near the stairs on like mounted in the floor like off to the side here floor mounted yeah. return or something believe it or not or even or even off to the side there where i have it near the thermostat believe it or not that's not a bad idea because any cold air falling down the stairs and hitting that floor is going to eventually flow into that return everything on my first floor was going to be floor, floor register yeah so and if you everything it, on the second floor was going to be ceiling register so if you put it off to the side, you see I have a, it's not right in front of the stairs, and I, by the way, I would never put a floor yep. return right in front of the stairs. Put it off to the side, that direction, mm -hmm. put it off to the side, that direction. Basically, it will pick up any cold air that's flowing down those stairs. Okay. Here, here, this is a situation where this is an attic right here where I put the duct work. So I'm going to put it over someplace here where it's, over a thermostat. Okay, by the way, where would you never put a thermostat? In the oven? Location I never want to put a thermostat. In the laundry room. Well, yeah, I don't think I'd put a thermostat in the laundry room because of the because of the heat and the fact that it's in a enclosed space. Would I ever want to put a thermostat here? Right next to the front door? No. Would I ever want to put a thermostat here? You don't ever put them on exterior walls. Well, I don't ever want to put them any place where it's going to get an artificial source of heat or cold. Now, I've seen a lot of thermostats installed in front hallways. It's not the best idea in the world. Okay, because every time that front door opens, you're changing the thermostat. Okay. What about what about a thermostat here? What would be wrong with that idea? It's right where you've got a supply. Well, not only that, it's on an outside wall. Yeah. It's going to pick up the heat and cool from that wall. So again, you want inside walls, interior spaces, near a return, if you can do it, and in an area where no one is going to possibly put an appliance directly in front of it, okay? If you look at this room here, the way this room is laid out, I could have put the thermostat here and I could have been okay. Okay, I could have put it on this wall. But look at this living room, the way it's laid out. Where's the one place in this room where someone's going to install that wall-mounted TV? on this wall. Okay, it's really the only place in this room where you have a wall. I don't want to put a thermostat next to that TV and next to that entertainment center because there's a lot of heat generated. You wouldn't put the TV on the back wall between the two windows so that your living area is back to the kitchen, easier to move the food? I, again, I... I, that's I think that's more of a dining room area. Yeah, I mean, is this going to be more of your dining room? Yeah, uh, so many people don't have formal dining rooms anymore that 
Yeah, you I know. know, but you sort of have to think about the outliers, okay? What's going to make yeah. most people happy? Yeah. Because you don't know when you're building new construction or when you're designing a system. You don't know what these people are going to do. So I normally try not to put anything on major walls. It's like why I, would never, I would never put, let me get rid of that line, I would never put a floor-mounted or a floor-mounted return over here for that same reason. Someone's going to put an entertainment center over there. Here, if someone puts a coffee table that's over a floor-mounted return, it still has room for still has room for air. Okay, it's less of these. Am I ever going to put a floor-mounted return in the at the bottom of a stairwell? No, because everyone coming down those stairs is going to stomp on it. Okay, and I'm not sure how many Legos you want to have to go pick out of that return every time somebody drops a box of Legos someplace. Believe me, it happens. Un okay. Unfortunately, unfortunately, everything to some degree, you know, you, you, you kind of can't win where you put it. You, I guess you're just looking for the lesser of evils. I'm looking I've for got... the least of all the evils. Yeah, I, I've got a friend of mine that got a call back uh, twice to somebody's house who they had a, they had a, a person who lost their house moved in with them and, and went, was renting one of the rooms or was staying in one of the rooms and nothing they could do could get the the heat up in the room so she was freezing in the winter the rest of the house was fine they got electric baseboard and it when he finally walked in and started looking around the room. He realized she took a little college-style refrigerator, put it on a stand against the wall just inside the door, and the heat from the back of the refrigerator was 10 inches below the thermostat in the room. When they changed it over from the old mercury-style thermostat to a digital, it was reading 90 degrees coming off the back of that. So they were turning it up to 90 degrees, and the heat wasn't coming up. Yeah, I mean, you see such strange things and sometimes when we talk about troubleshooting one of the things that I tell people is where do you start troubleshooting when you get out to a house where's the first place you go for troubleshooting where's the first place in a house I go when I'm troubleshooting thermostat thermostat, thermostat. you can find out so much evils by just looking at the thermostat. Okay, two weeks ago, okay, I was out at a house that had an insurance claim, and I looked at the back of the thermostat, okay, because the thermostat wasn't displaying, and therefore the system was bad, and they needed to install a new system. Go figure that. But anyway, you know how batteries go in a thermostat, and you're supposed to have the negative side touching the positive side? Okay, so this is like the positive of the thermostat, then you have the net or the negative of the battery, and then you have negative and positive in the center. Yeah. Okay. Apparently, Mrs. Homeowner had changed the batteries out and had done... Um, had put one in backwards, so the two positives were together, and the negatives were on the outside. How well did that thermostat work? Not well. Not well. The contractor who they called took a look at the equipment, said, "Oh, you need to change your you need to change your air conditioning out." Never looked at the thermostat. So, I mean, always start at the thermostat because a lot of customer interaction happens at the thermostat. Okay, I really wanted to go over the duct work a little bit today and show how it fits into the space. That was sort of the purpose of our get-together this morning was to see how the duct works business fits into the space. Again, this is not part of your final project, but I know some of you did want to sort of take a look at this in your own houses, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that. Um, anyone have any questions? For 